All right, and welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study here at Expedition Church of the Triad. So glad to have you joining us right here. Uh, remember, we have services Wednesday nights at 7, Sunday mornings at 1030. You're always invited to come join us in person. We'd love to see you at 6302 Walter Wright Road here in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina, 27313. We are 4.3 miles from Interstate 85 at exit 124, the Elm Eugene exit. Um, Pleasant Garden is really just kind of like a blip in the Greensboro um, <laughs> Metroplex, all right? We, we are right next to it. And uh, kind of Greensboro kind of circles around it. So um, if they had their way, they would annex the whole little thing. It would be Greensboro. But we're Pleasant Garden. It sounds better than Greensboro anyway. Pleasant Garden. Doesn't that sound lovely? You say Pleasant Garden. I remember when we first moved into the area, um, I remember Janie saying about, that's such a nice sounding name. Now, this, you know, when we first got here, had no idea that this many years later we'd be here with the church. All righty. Well, if you've been with us the past few weeks, we've been ministering on redeemed, spiritual death, poverty, and sickness. Last week we covered poverty, and we have been covering um, before this healing. And so we, whenever you're doing certain things, certain subjects, they're going to overlap with different sermons. Doesn't matter. It's going to happen. You teach on, uh, you teach on healing, you overlap on faith. You teach on healing, um, for all, and then you teach on healing being part of the uh, redeemed from the curse, they overlap. It just, it's the way it is. It's the nature of it, um, which is fine because repetition is good for you. Amen? Hearing it again and again. We need to be like that Frosty Morn commercial. Some of you are old enough to remember Frosty Morn. How many, how many remember Frosty Morn? You sing it over and over and over again. Frosty morn. And they were cold cuts and hot dogs. Um, you know, you used, to get by, used to buy frosty morn hot dogs. They were the red kind. You know, they had the dye in them. You know? <laughs> I cried like a baby when my daddy told me at about six or seven years old they weren't going to have red hot dogs anymore because they were taking the dye out. <laughs> no! <laughs> you can't do that. So when I find a red one, I go eat it. And when you bite into it, it's red. You know, a certain distance, seeing as how far the dye goes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I pray. Praise God. Well, anyway, we are teaching over Dean from spiritual death, poverty, and sickness. We've covered spiritual death. We've covered poverty. Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it's written, curse is every one that hangeth on a tree. Amen. Uh, redeemed, we're just going to re recap since it's been a little bit since we read the, uh, the foundational stuff, uh, means to a payment of a price to recover from the power of another, to ransom, to buy back. Metaphorically, used of Christ freeing the elect from the dominion of the Mosaic law at the price of his vicarious, vicarious death. Amen. Aren't you glad uh, that we have been redeemed? Amen? Glory to God. We've been purchased back. We've been bought with a price. Not as silver and gold. Amen? But with the precious blood of Christ. Glory to God. Amen? He bought our spiritual, uh, bought us back from spiritual death with his blood. He bought us back from poverty with his blood. He bought us back from sickness with his blood. Amen? Hallelujah. So let's talk about, let's go over, like, like I said last week, we covered poverty, and um, we're going to move on to this week um, to sickness. Look at, you know, Deuteronomy chapter 28. We're not going to read that because we've already, we've already been reading them there. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Dick, I don't know how fast you are. If I turn my head through my arm, I'm going to mute it because the people online probably don't want to get their ears blown out. <laughs> And in here, they probably don't want the speakers going, pow! I do not sneeze quietly. I'm a loud sneezer. I mean, um, I did it one time riding by a graveyard, and three people came out of the grave. Scared the life into them. Hallelujah. But if you look at Deuteronomy 28, sickness is part of the curse. Sickness came into the earth because of the fall of man. 
okay? His body became mortal or death-doomed, susceptible to sickness and disease. Before the fall, man was not susceptible to disease. It, there wasn't any until, Adam, until Satan perverted everything through the fall of Adam. God did not put sickness in the earth. He created it perfect. He saw that it was good. Amen. When you read, when you read Genesis, particularly the first three chapters, when God created, he, said, he saw that it was good. Amen. It was when the fall took place that evil entered in. All right. Um, but here we have, now remember Jesus bore our sin on the cross. Remember, um, uh, we quoted it, um, right? Who was on, well, let me read it again. I don't want to misquote the verse number. Okay. First Peter 2.24. Whose own self bear our sin in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Okay? Quoting Isaiah 53, by whose stripes you are healed. Isaiah was prophecy. Okay? It was, it was foretelling of a coming event. Isaiah 53, 5, who, by whose stripes you are healed. Um, 1 Peter 2, 24 declares the fulfillment of that prophecy. Jesus has bore our sicknesses. Matthew 16, uh, Matthew um, 9, uh, 8, 16, 17, make, make it clear that it's talking about physical diseases and not the spiritual disease of sin. We get real theological. No, that was, that was when you got born again. That was taken care of. Amen? God made provision for our physical bodies. Hallelujah. So Jesus bore us in. Look at Isaiah 53. We'll read verses 1 through 5. Isaiah 53. Sometimes we've, we've covered these, this material so many times over the years that there's a temptation just to kind of fly by it as if everybody knows it by heart. Amen. You know, how many learned, your, uh, how many learned Pythagoras' theorem when you were in school? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. It's the measurement of a triangle. If you have two sides of the triangle, you can figure out the third side. Amen. That's all it takes. Because you know that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So by having two of those numbers, you can figure out the whole thing. Right? All right? You can figure out the distance. Isn't that wonderful? Amen? Now, how many use that every day? I remember one day I was I was doing something um, at the school. I was trying to figure out how long a cable would be going. You know, how long it would take to come across here. So I measured down there and I measured over there. I had those two measurements. I knew what this measurement was going to be by figuring that out. Amen. And then taking the square root of the of the, of the um, final answer. Then I knew exactly, oh, it's going to be, I forgot, it's going to be like 16 feet. Well, if I go down the wall, it's going to be 12 plus another um, 15, it's going to be 27 feet. So you will buy 10 feet too much wire, okay, because you were going there, here. But by doing Pythagoras' theorem, I was able to take that and work it out, figure out exactly what it was across that, across there. So it had all these distances. Amen. Isn't that lovely? All right? Um, but what I'm saying is that's, that's something that you've got to rehearse. If you were going to go teach a math class and you had to teach that, guess what you're going to be doing? You're going back and covering that material again to get what? Refreshed. Amen? Amen? You've got to get refreshed. Well, same thing with Bible. We need to stay, we need to stay refreshed. So, but it is a habit, even when preaching, to assume everybody's, oh, yeah, they're, they're up on this. Yeah. I've, I'm a, I've never been ceased to be amazed at how many times I've been in a service and the minister will cover a scripture or a passage that I've read so many times and you just kind of, you almost tune them out while they're reading it because you already read it so many times. Then you, you arrest yourself and say, stop, listen. And the next thing you know, you're hearing something you never heard before or seeing something you never saw before. 
or reminded of something, you kind of let slip. Amen? Everybody can be guilty of that. So, let's just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slow down, not assume, okay? Because we can't have people watching who never heard it. All right? Jesus bore our sickness on the cross. Isaiah chapter 53, we'll start in verse 1. And uh, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. Now, this is talking about Jesus. This is a prophecy about Jesus. He hath no form, no comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now, that just, you know, I've said this before, I'll say it again. That just kind of knocks in the head the GQ preacher look. You're trying to be hip and cool to get people to attend. You ain't being like Jesus because he had no form of comeliness that people should desire him. They weren't coming out to hear him because he had on skinny jeans, tunic top, bed head, and the, and the most expensive shoes you can wear. Matter of fact, I'm not sure I've all listened to you anyway if you're dressed like that. That's just my, me. I'm not into that, that kind of cool. Not even, it's not even cool to me, but anyway. Okay? He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows. Okay? So he is a man of sorrows, right? Okay? 53. All right. Um, he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. All right? Yeah, I'm trying to find something here that in my margin. Yeah. He's acquainted with pains. Amen. All right. Glory to God. He's acquainted with pains and um, man of sickness, really. And I mean, pains and then of acquainted with God. I'm sorry. I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to see my old Bible because I got a new Bible and I didn't have it written over here. Macab and Koile. Which Hebrew word, which is which, which one? Because you should have my notes. I could just look at it and say, that's that one. And I haven't put it in here yet. And um, I'm sorry. And my phone's not with me where I can look it up on my app and look up the Strong's number and get the word. Because <laughs> I don't bring it to the pulpit. So um, you have two Greek wor Hebrew, Hebrew, Hebrew words here. Makab, M-A-K-O-B, and Koile, C-H-O-L-I. Koile. Okay. Um, the King James translates them kind of backwards from what they really are. They do mean that they do mean these things, but they're not the primary meaning. Okay. Um, the word sorrows actually means sickness. Grief means pains. Okay. So he's a man of sickness, acquainted with our pains, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and we just esteemed him not. Hallelujah. Um, John, will you just run in my office and get my phone? I'm, I'm going to get this right. I know this is kind of, you know, on the fly right here in front of everybody, but I'm going to get that right. And um, I will have it in my Bible before I, I teach out of this chapter again. You know, don't you how you got notes somewhere in your notes? You can see it. I can see my lines up there, and I can see the right word. <laughs> it's just not in this one. Hallelujah. So we're going to go. Fill up the um, Esword app. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And uh, we're going to look at Esword. And we're going to look at the King James Plus, which has the Strong's numbers. And then we're going to go to Isaiah. Hallelujah. Um, we're going to go to Isaiah 53. Verse 3. Okay. All right. Okay. And then... There we go. There we go. Corley is C-H-O-L-I-Y. Okay. Macab, M-A-K-O-B. Um, M-A-K-O-B. Okay. Macab. Macab, which is translated sorrows here, is grief or affliction, pain, pain. Grief is koile, which is sickness. That the word they translated grief is sickness. All right. Glory to God. So I got that straight. Amen? Amen? 
I got it straight. So grief is sickness in Hebrew. It does also mean, but it's not the primary meaning. Okay. Um, so he made him, he's a man of pains, acquainted with sickness. Um, we hid as that were our faces from him. We, we, he was despised, we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, sicknesses, and carried our sorrows, pains, and yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Okay. Um, so we have a prophecy here. This pointing, you can look at the cross. Stripes, he was whipped and beaten with the whip so bad. It's, you know, it wasn't just, it wasn't just a normal cow whip from the West. It was a, it was a Roman scourging whip, which was, I mean, if you ever saw the Passion of Christ with um, Jim Caviezel, um, that is a very realistic depiction of what it actually happened. Okay, I think we said this the other week that when they would, they filmed that, uh, they had like leather on his back about this thick, you know. But some of the some of the shards wrapped around under his underside and cut him up under here. Yeah, doing the scene. Had no idea they needed to wrap it all the way around. To do the scene, and um, so he got cut doing that scene. And um, it, but that was very realistic. Three Roman scourges. Um, it wasn't a long whip; it was a short. They were short, wide, and they had bone or nails or rock or pottery in the end. So when they pulled it back, it just tore flesh. A Roman scourging was thirty-nine stripes. I mean, forty stripes, save one but done by three people. It wasn't just more like 120. You know, we're taking turns, whack, 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 going at it. Okay? Jesus paid a price for your healing. With his stripes, you were healed. First Peter 2, 24, whose own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin shall live unto righteousness. By whose stripes, ye were healed. Okay? And so, Isaiah prophesies it. Peter declares it a, a, an accomplished fact. Matthew 8, 16, when evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying he took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Now notice that he bore our sicknesses. Now he, Isaiah 53, 5, and King James says, bore our griefs. When they, when they translated um, Matthew 8, it says he bore our sicknesses because that's what the word really conveys. But he's not talking about spiritual, the spiritual sickness of sin. He's talking about physical ailments. He healed them that were sick. Amen. So we have here, this, this, is, our, this is our premise. Jesus bore our sicknesses. At the same time, he bore our sin. Amen. He bore our sicknesses at the same time he bore our sin. He carried them to the cross. Aren't you glad? So, um, like we said earlier when we were teaching along these lines um, um, in another series, um, you know, we could preach God's uh, sick, uh, forgiveness and healing, God's double cure. He wants to forgive you spiritually. He wants to heal you physically. Okay? All right. We also said that Jesus demonstrated the will of God in his ministry. <coughs> now, it's very interesting. Jesus said, and I'm not sure this is in my notes here. Nope, 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 nope. Okay. Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also in greater than these because I go unto the Father. Okay. So the works that he did. We have here, Jesus saying in John 6, 38, I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. So what Jesus, Jesus' own declaration about his ministry is that whatever you see me doing is the will of God. Christians spend more time trying to pray out 
the will of God over things that are already clear in the Bible uh, that they miss it. Okay? Lord, heal me if it's your will. Heal our dear beloved sister if it's your will. Well, it's his will. It's his will. It's already in Scripture. We see Jesus healing the sick. The only, the only place we even come close to him possibly rejecting somebody's request is the woman whose daughter was um, uh, possessed with devils. I believe it was our Phoenician woman. Came to him and said, you know, um, and kept bothering me. He said, what, what do you want? She said, uh, my daughter's vexed and I wanted to be free. He said, that's not right. I'm going to put it in English, modern English. It's not right to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. Now, 99.99% of the church today would get up and walk out and go, hey, you know that preacher called me? That preacher called me a dog. I I'm going to tell you, that's going on Facebook. That's going on every social media you got. It's going on television. It's going to be in the nightly news. Preacher called me a dog. Yeah. But he didn't call her a dog to demean her. She was, she, th th their, their race was considered dogs by the Jews. They were outside the covenant. What he was saying, right, it's not right to take that which belongs to the covenant people and give it to non-covenant people. And she went, yeah, you're right, Lord. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. See? He, she couldn't get it based on covenant. She had no right to it. They're still under the old covenant. Jesus' ministry was an old covenant ministry. Are y'all here? You're going home. It was not a New Testament ministry. It was an Old Testament ministry operating under the Abrahamic covenant. Then a new covenant came in, established upon better promises. Amen. But at that time, he's ministering, so she cannot access it by covenant right. Had to locate her. He wanted to find out where she was because <laughs> she said, yeah, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs. She said, I know I'm not in the family, and I know I'm not part of the covenant, but all I need is a crumb. And he said, woman. Great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was set free. Glory to God. I said glory to God. Amen. How did she get it? By faith. Faith just overrode the whole thing. I said faith overrode the whole thing. Glory to God. She accessed what she didn't have right to by faith because she saw him in operation. She knew who he was, and she came and said, I'm coming to get my stuff. You call me a dog, fine. I'll be a dog. Just give me a crumb. I got it. That preacher told me that I didn't have any faith. That preacher said, I'm not studying the word enough. That preacher said, and miss the whole thing. Miss your healing. Miss your blessings. Because you got offended. Well, that ought right, to tell you right there, you're not studying the word. I'm going to step in it. Great peace have they that love thy law. And nothing shall offend them. Hello? You're manipulating. No, I'm just saying what the Bible says. If that woman had gotten offended, her daughter would not have been free. She said, call me a dog. Fine, I'm a dog. <laughs> Give me a crumb. Yeah. She got what she came for. I said, he, she got what she came for. And then there are people standing there not getting it who have a right to 
They want it served up on a platter. Porter house. Medium. Hello? With the right dry rub on it before they cooked it. And some real butter. Not no margarine. I mean pure. Yeah, soft, creamy butter. Just slap it on top of that Bruce Chris steak on that 500 degree platter. And the butter just runs all over it and down the side. And you can present the truth to people just like that and they'll miss it. And you'll have somebody come by and drop down and grab a crumb that fell on the floor and get their answer. Hallelujah. It just takes that little bit of faith to really believe, just to act on it. If you have faith, the grain of a mustard seed, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done. You shall speak under the sycamine tree and say, be cast down under into the sea, and it shall obey you. Amen. I said amen. Oh, my. Hallelujah. So Jesus came to show the will of God. So his ministry is a representation of the will of the Father. That's why I challenge people, go study his ministry. Before you pray, if it be thy will over being healed or being saved or certain things in the Bible, the only time Jesus prayed that prayer was in the Garden of Gethsemane. That was not his general prayer. He didn't go to Lazarus' tomb and go, Father, if it be thy will, raise him up. No, when he got to the tomb, what did he say? Father, I thank thee that thou always hearest me. Because he knew what he was going to do. Amen. Thank you, you hear me. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus. Oh, Lazarus, come forth. Little Carmen there. <laughs> yeah. And listen. Lazarus didn't come walking out. He had to come hopping out. How do you know? Because the Bible, he said, go loose him and let him go. He was still wrapped in his grave clothes, and they had already cocooned. He had to obey. Somebody said, why did he say Lazarus? Because if he hadn't, everybody would have got up. <laughs> he just said, come forth. Everybody would have got up and came out. Hello. Talk about walk, night of the walking dead. We did have that when Jesus was resurrected. Many of the old saints came out of their graves and went in the city and were seen of many. I believe Matthew, whatever, verse 54 says, down in one of the latter chapters, the, the people came out of the graves. They stopped by and grabbed their body on the way up for a minute, go tell everybody that Jesus is the Messiah, and then dropped it back off and went to heaven. Yeah. Glory to God. But Jesus ministered, you know, did his will. Jesus, uh, in John 14, 5 through 11, look over there. It could have been Isaiah. It could have been, it could have been all over the place. And I'm getting into the all over the place role here. John 14, verse 9. We better back up. I'm going to tell you what. We're going to verse 1. All right? Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions or dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. So if you want a little old log cabin over in the corner of heaven, I'll bet you he'll let you have one. Now, it might be 10,000 square feet with a fish thing in front of it <clears throat> and a wraparound porch, but, you know, Anyway, um, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Whether you, I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. Now, Thomas had a problem. Finally got straightened out, but he had a problem. Okay? Um, and how can we know with the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. 
Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. That's King Jimmy for, Lord, show us the Father, that's good enough for us. Sufficeth. That's with them tongue twisters. We can't get people filled with the Holy Ghost quoting that, though. All right? Get them tongue tied, and we're going to speak it in tongues. Hallelujah. And Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And sayest thou then, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believe thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. And then he goes on and says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do, and greater than these, because I go unto the Father. Now stop. What did Jesus just say? It's not even really me doing the works. It's the Father in me doing them. So you can't say Jesus had one will and God the Father had a different will. Jesus is the will of God. His ministry is the will of the Father. What he carried out as the second person of the Godhead manifest in flesh, he walked out and carried out the will of the Father in the earth. Find me one. One. Uno. Uh. One. We'll do a little three-dog night here. One is the loneliest number. One. All right, anyway. Why were they called three-dog night? I do not know. There were three of them. I guess they considered themselves dog and they sang at night. I don't know. That's some cool, you know, grassrootsy rock from that era. I like a lot of, this. you know, they're the one that did joy to the world. You know, Jeremiah's a bullfrog. That was them. All right. How does that become a hit? 70s. <laughs> that says it all, you know. Um, anyway. Jesus declares that he does the will of God. So I challenge you, I challenge you out there, find one place in the ministry of Jesus where he walks up to some random person or anybody, just not even random, lays his hands on them and gives them leprosy or cancer or kills them or anything like that. Now, if he is carrying out the will of the Father, and the narrative of the church today in so many places is God gave you that to teach you a lesson, and he's not taking it off of you because it's not his will, then please show me in Scripture where you can find something that supports that. In the ministry of Jesus, Find me a passage in the ministry of Jesus that will support that narrative. Don't waste your time because you can't. It ain't there. I said it ain't there. Pardon me. It isn't there. Okay. It's not that you can't find it because it's not there. Now, I've got to believe in three and a half years of ministry, that as he ministered, as the, as the will of the Father in the earth manifest in flesh, and of course, according to the church world today, 95% of the folks are sick because God put it on them to teach them a lesson. Come on, you've heard it. And he's not healing them because it's not his will. You got to think that there was at least one case <coughs> where Jesus demonstrated that side of the Father's will. And we don't have it. We don't have it. And then Jesus went on and said this, even if you don't believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me, at least believe me for the work's sake. What I'm doing. Because it's the Father. It shows people Him. Glory to God. It reveals the Father. The healing, the raising of the dead, the casting out of devils. 
Hello? It's a revelation in natural form, an unveiling, more of an unveiling of the heart and the will of the Father in a natural means to humanity. But we'll, get into, we'll spend time in our churches. We'll spend time counseling people. Our ministers will spend time preaching about, you know, God doesn't heal today. Those healing evangelists are the devil. Wow. Yet, of the, we've talked about this a few weeks ago. Of the commissions that Jesus gave, every one of them included what? Every commission gave, Jesus gave during his ministry and at the Great Commission, what did they include? Healing. <clears throat> he didn't say go put cancer on people. He didn't go say kill somebody's baby to teach those people a lesson. They go heal. Heal the sick. Amen. I said Amen. Why? Because God loves people. His heart, was it was never for man to be sick. That came because of the fall. What does sickness represent? An action of Satan in the earth that God hates. So he sent Jesus to rectify what Satan was doing in the earth by providing divine supernatural healing for people's bodies because he hates Satan's works. And he hates Satan's works because they're diametrically opposed to him, his character and his nature. Satan wants to hurt people. He wants to imprison them. He wants to kill them. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, to destroy. I am come that they might have life. Zoe, life in the, life in the max, uh, life to the full. Life that the man of the father has it. That which he of himself took and gave unto the son, and the Son now is in turn given unto us. <clears throat> Amen. But the thief kills. The thief steals. The thief destroys. And sickness does not produce life. I said sickness does not produce life. It's a wrecker. It destroys people's bodies. It destroys people's families. It runs people away from God. I don't see where sickness draws people to God. Even people who say, well, I'm just trying to figure out what the Lord's doing. Because they, because they, because they, they love God. And they can't understand why a loving father would do that to them or to a very close loved one. But they're just taking it on blind faith because they've been trained that way. And I'm glad they're staying with God. But I can tell you, over time, bitterness and resentment will, be, will build up in their hearts. Why? Well, I don't understand why. Why would you do that? Well, baby, if it's killing, stealing, or destroying, it wasn't God. God wasn't in that. God didn't send leukemia. God didn't send um, AIDS. You know, we had a whole bunch of people teaching, you know, God gave people AIDS for their you know, perverse lifestyle. No, your perverse lifestyle gave you AIDS. Hello? I mean, really? Uh, I think I think one of the one of the narratives is that the study, you know, they've done that it came from having relations with monkeys in Africa. That in itself's gross. Okay? Listen, you know where uh, uh, some of our SDSs came from? The Spaniards going into South America, having relations with llamas, got a disease called syphilis. Yeah. Or a yama. Is it a yama? Is llama pronounced yama? It's because it's double L. You don't, you don't know. Okay. Okay. So what, yama? Yama, yama. Okay. Yeah. Double L gives it kind of the Y-ish sound. All right. Think about that. God didn't give them syphilis. He gave it to themselves. Because they were driven by inordinate passions. Hello. Y'all hear you go home? 
God didn't do that to people. Thank you for your enthusiasm. You're getting kind of gross. I'm not sure. Listen, it's time we stop blaming God for stuff God didn't do. Amen. Are you here? You go home. Age was not, a, was not in the general population until the government covered it up and made it so you couldn't tell people were infected with this disease. And then it spread through blood transfusion because you couldn't tell anybody. Nobody had the right to know that you had AIDS. And it was spread over into the general population. That was evil. I said it was evil. Okay? God did not send diseases. He didn't put that on people. So that's what I got off on all that because people say, God, AIDS was a judgment of God on this. Well, Now you got people getting it through blood transfusions. Is that the judgment of God on a normal family that had a blood transfusion and, you know, got tainted blood? It's evil. Okay? Acts 10 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. The Father in me, he doeth the works. He went around healing the sick. Amen. He healed. And who were they oppressed by? They were oppressed by who? The devil. The devil. The devil. Amen. The devil was, is oppressing people. Directly or indirectly, sickness comes from the enemy. And then he uses man to make stuff. We didn't have COVID-19. They took a bunch of viruses and put them together and created the super virus. What for? So they could create the vaccine and make billions of dollars. And it did not come because bats were eaten out of some market in Wahoo or whatever it was. The virus was released. Well, you're just being conspiracy theorist. No, I don't know if you know this or not. They had the virus right here at the University of North Carolina in a lab there for a period of time before it broke out. Right here in America. Why do you create a super virus that would not naturally mutate Unless you're planning on selling the vaccine, that that they could they did all kinds of stuff to create that under the guise they were doing preventative to stop a virus that could mutating. It wouldn't have mutated that way. It took people deliberately engineering it. Hello. Why? Because you've got rich, rich people who are going to get rich, 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 rich off that and wipe out people at the same time. But Jesus heals COVID-19 and every variant of it that they made. Hallelujah. He's greater than COVID-19. Hello? And these things mutate. And once, once they're created, once they're out there, they will mutate. Viruses do that. That's all right. Jesus has got a mutated answer. Amen. He heals every disease named now in the book of this book of law and those that aren't named. He gets them all. So you can have a COVID-19 variant 75,000 and it's still Jesus still is the healer. Amen. I said amen. Well, this was super engineered to do this. Turn off your television. Stop listening to everybody come out and say, there's a new variant out there. You need to get your COVID booster vaccine. I didn't take the original. Not taking it. Hello? Aren't you afraid you're going to die? Nope. Not from COVID-19 or its variant. When I've lived a long life and he satisfies me and I'm satisfied, then I'll go home. Amen. 
Jesus goes about healing all. Can you say amen to that? Praise God. Now, God wants us to be in him. 3 John 2. Beloved, I wish, now as we've talked about this numerous times, the word wish in Greek would really be better translated pray. Okay? I pray above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prosper. Be in health. That's talking about their soul. No, because he said, even as our soul prosper. In relation to prosperity and health, in relation to the prosperity of your soul. What do you mean? You're feeding on the study in the Word. You're full of God's will. You understand God's purpose. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Who healeth all thy diseases. Go to Luke chapter 13 and we're going to quit there. We'll see. We need to quit there. It's, we're running out of time. You know, we call this the hour of power. I added I-S-H on the end of it. The hourish of power. Kind of somewhere around that hour thing, you know. Kind of gives me some leeway. I'm fudging stuff, just like the officials do for the Dallas Cowboys, particularly when they're playing in Dallas. Jerry got to talk to them before the game. Love you, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Looking up here at um, verse 10, and he was teaching in one of their synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of, infirmity, spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could no wise lift herself up. Now, she um, had some back, crippling back problems. So she's bowed over, can't stand up straight. 18 years she's lived like this. And when Jesus saw her, he called for her to come to him. He said unto her, woman, thou art loosed. From thine infirmity. He lays hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. She glorified God. She glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. Because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. And he said... <clears throat> There are, eight, there are six days in which men ought to work. In them, therefore, and come be healed, and not on the Sabbath. Hello? <clears throat> Almost sound like Emperor Palpatine. And the Lord answered him and said, You're right, buddy. I shouldn't have healed her on the Sabbath. You know, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, we should have obeyed the law. She could have suffered one more day and got it. No. You hypocrite. Now, I'm sure you could probably add some more adjectives. You low down, dirty dog hypocrite. You're a double dog hypocrite. Doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And all not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. What he probably wanted to add to that, but he didn't, you dog hypocrite, why didn't you do something about it? She's got a covenant right to it. You're the priest. Hmm? But to hide their failure, he gets mad that they violated the Sabbath. Ooh. Amen. Who had her bound? Well, modern theology says Jesus did, and God does. A little too modern for me. When the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, says Satan had bound her, she was bound by Satan. And she should be loosed on the Sabbath day. Why? 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 
She's in covenant. She's a child of Abraham. She had a right to be healed. They're ticked off that they don't know how to do the work of God. They know how to collect money and live off the temple. They weren't interested in helping people. They were making their living. They didn't care about the people. They had them under their, they had them under their power. They had them under their authority. They had to do what they said. Because they were the priest. <laughs> Jesus had a couple things said about that. My house should be called a house of prayer. You made it a den of thieves. Ripping the people off. Woo! You better be glad he won't sing in that song. He could have called 10,000 angels and wiped them out. I said he could, have, he could have taken them out. But he had to fulfill the plan of the Father. Amen? It's part of, see, if it's under the old covenant, Please don't come to me with some stupid, weak, imbecile theology that that belonged to the Jews. Okay. Have you read the scripture that said he's the one who's a Jew outwardly, but inwardly, whose circumcision is not of the flesh, but of the heart? So I'm a Jew. I said, I'm a Jew. I have right to receive what God has. And if it was just for the Jews, well, praise God, I qualify. Because I've got the spiritual circumcision of the heart. And Paul said, I, I'm a Jew. Amen. I said, amen. So healing is under the redemption. It's part of the redemption clause. Amen. It belongs to us. We have a right to it. Amen. We just watched the preacher's wife the other night, so I kind of want to kind of do that preacher scene. Am I right about it? You know, get with you up there singing, and here we go. Amen. You know when they made that movie, her mama was the, Sissy Houston, was the woman, Miss whatever her name was, was the leader of that choir. That was the Georgia Mass Choir, and that her mama was when it ran that choir. They said when they got to singing that song at the end of the movie, they couldn't stop them. They were saying, cut, 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 and they just kept right on going. <laughs> they didn't stop. They just went on. You can turn the cameras off if you want to. We gone. <laughs> Hallelujah. So healing is part of the, the um, being redeemed from spiritual death, poverty, and sickness. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Now, a couple of things coming up. Uh, this Sunday, we'll be teaching on um, joy. Third Sunday of Advent will be joy on Christmas Eve Sunday. We're not having church here in the building, okay? We are going to broadcast. Now, I cannot promise you what it's going to be. We have to look at our time frame and schedule. You know, we're going to, it's either going to be a live remote or a tape delay remote of the fourth Advent of love, okay? We'll make that determination. You won't know the difference because it's going to look the same. All right? I don't know if we're going to ride over here and do it in the church or not. I don't know. <coughs> Other than driving over here, it might be the easiest. But um, we could also do it right in front of my fireplace with the stockings hanging and chestnuts roasting on an open fire. All right? Hallelujah. Have people out there by and just, you know, take the, the door off the gas fireplace, stick them in. All right, praise God. Sergio, glad to have you back again. All right, hallelujah. It's time to receive our Wednesday night tithe and offering. If you need an offering envelope, they're on the seat back in front of you. Uh, do remember, whenever you're giving, if you're giving with cash, it is best that you at least notify us who you is. Okay? Because if you don't tell us who you is, we can't figure out who you are. Amen? Y'all here, you go home. All right. Hallelujah. Father, we bless the people who say, Kyle, give into the kingdom of God. Thank you. The heavens and windows are open. 
and you pour out blessings they don't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget we're coming up on EOI, end of year. And um, the wonderful thing about our country currently is that you, don't you know about this? You can give and get tax write-offs. So this is a good time of the year to give a special offering not only for a tax write-off. If you want to. If you don't need one, that's fine. Hallelujah. But instead of giving to United Way, give to Expedition Church. Amen? All right. Praise God. All right. Love you guys. Bless you. Don't forget, Sunday morning at 1030. We're right here in the place. And Advent Sunday on joy. All right. Have a great week, guys. See you then. Good night, everybody. See you next time here at Expedition Church. Sorry, Dick. Remember this? First John chapter 5, verse 4. Whatsoever born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you. Good night. See you next time here at Expedition Church of the Triad.